Brethren, I hope you are all having a, a wonderful Pentecost. It is such a privilege to be able to even be here and observe God's feast days. It's tremendous. You know, with recent DNA technology, a whole new industry has developed. And that is having your DNA tested to find out who your relatives are. Going way back, your family origins. <clears throat> All sorts of products are now available. You can order Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, MyHeritage DNA testing, a number of others. It's become quite a thing. And one of the trends that has now, sounds like is developing and is uh, where some have even taken to live streaming their results. And uh, sometimes they're very happy and sometimes they're shocked, you know, at, at what is in their family and, and uh, you know, way back there. It's interesting to know something about our family, especially if we have lost track or if we have not been shared that information for whatever reason by our parents and grandparents and or they don't know and, and we, we find out, where did I come from? What have you learned about your family? <clears throat> what I've found is that as a person grows older, you take more interest in it. It's a whole lot more of a something that you want, you want to know about the past. You want to know what came before. And uh, I've learned some interesting things about my family in recent years and, and in, in a number of years over time. On my mother's side, <clears throat> we have a, uh, a relative, a distant relative, I guess, who wrote a series of novels about a migration of Germans back in the 18th century from Germany down into Hungary, and uh, a series of novels, but it's describing the, 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 the things that happened to this group of people. And as they resettled uh, a very wild land there in Hungary, and it's interesting, the series, or one of the books was called Remember to Tell the Children. Remember to tell the children. In other words, there were things that needed to be told. There were stories that needed to be preserved to pass on. My great-grandmother on my mother's side <clears throat> came over from Germany as a teenager to this country and was on a ship crossing the Atlantic just as World War, II, World War I sorry, broke out. And it's interesting just how different her life would have been, our life would have been, maybe not even be here, if she had left one day later, or a few hours later even. On my dad's side, we have an ancestor whose brother was named Alexander Whitaker. He was one of the original ministers uh, who came to Jamestown, Virginia, back in around 1609 or so. And according to family lore, he was the one who baptized Pocahontas, which is kind of interesting, all the way, all the way back there. And, uh, and one of our trips, I, I picked up a book with diaries of Jamestown, those who lived in the, in the Jamestown settlement. And there's an essay called Good News from Virginia that he wrote. And it was essentially imploring the stakeholders back in England to continue supporting this fledgling plantation, this good land in Virginia when there were, there were others who were, uh, who were not so favorable to it. But it was the good news from Virginia back in the early 1600s. One of our aunts, my Aunt Peggy from Arkansas, she's deceased now, but spent many years researching and and back in 2007, put together a, a book tracing the history of, of some in, in the McNair line. And she compiled a book, and, and it included a number of letters 
from my great, our great, great grandfather, John Williams McNair. He was a medic in the Civil War, drafted into the Union Army. Please forgive me, all those Southerners here. <laughs> and while he was in New York waiting to be shipped down to Savannah, and their group was going to meet up with, with Sherman at that time, he wrote a letter to his wife. December 27th, 1864. He said, Dear Mita, I'm getting very anxious to hear from home, though you know that much without me telling you. We've got along this far without any accident, and I hope we will be successful the balance of our time. We're out on this campaign. Take care of yourself and the children. God only knows how you'll get such things as you're bound to have, for I don't expect I'll get any money before my time's up, and if I had it, it would be a very uncertain business to send it home. I want you to send me your likeness. I guess that's a picture. I would rather have it this morning than have $100 laid in my hand. As bad as I need the money. Mita, I want you to write often. When I get to a place where I can receive them, for a letter from you does me more good than you think it could. I want you to give my regards to all my friends, tell them to write to me. John, he had two boys, a little girl. John was one of them. John, I want you and Leo to be good boys. Don't fight with Mary. That was the little girl. And mind your mother. Mind what she tells you. Mita, be good to the children. Make them mind you. Remember me in your prayers. I trust God and his mercies will remember you and comfort you in all your troubles. J.W. McNair, December 27, 1864. He survived. The war ended, of course, middle of 1865. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, it ended just before he would have been in a battle where one of his relatives would have been on the other side. Like happened so many times. Brothers fighting brothers. But he didn't have to face that. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to read the letters because you, you get a very raw sense of something that happened 150 years ago and the things that people went through and to, to, to know that this was a relative of mine. On my wife's side, my wife's family roots were in the a German Baptist brethren, They're like the Mennonites, and... Uh, According to what, we're, <clears throat> what we've uh, understood, they, they, that church had the root, their roots in the true church of God, not in the Protestant movement. And during the Civil War, they were conscientious objectors. And as I, I believe I understand it correctly, there, a group of them had an audience with Abraham Lincoln to explain their, their beliefs and were given conscientious objector status. But some were persecuted, some were harassed. <clears throat> I think one minister in their group was even told at one point by a group that came to the farm, tell your family goodbye, you're not going to see them again. Then they took him back behind the barn, and they didn't kill him, but they, they stuck a hose down his throat and turned on in in. in pump water down his throat, damaged his, his vocal cords for the rest of his life. Survived, but, you know, they, they, uh, they, they, they persecuted <clears throat> those who stood up for their beliefs. You know, not all things you find out about your family are positive. Some years ago, my dad was, had discovered that he was, we are a, a relative of Sir Francis Drake, and he was very excited about that and sharing the news when someone told him, you know, Mr. McNair, Sir Francis Drake was never married. <laughs> Changes it slightly, doesn't it? You know? 
But regardless, it's, it's interesting to understand where we came from and, and even to understand a little bit more of who we are and why we are the way we are because of our roots. Helps us understand that we are not just islands in the sea. We are part of a long line of human beings just like us who were born, who lived and died, and that cycle has continued over and over again. We need to have context of who we are. We need that. It helps us in our daily struggles to not feel alone. To not feel like we're the first ones who've ever faced trials and setbacks. If others persevered, so can we. It gives us perspective. It gives us a bigger picture. So what does this have to do with Pentecost? Well, we have a spiritual family. We are a spiritual family. The day of Pentecost highlights that family and turns our minds to that family's history. Maybe you haven't learned about your family history or done, don't have an opportunity to have that research available. But either way, there's an even more important family that we're a part of, that you're a part of, that I'm a part of, and we've got a family history right here. This is our family history, the most important family history, the true family history. Let's examine that a little bit today and what it means for us in our daily walk and the challenges that we face and will face in our lives, because that's the history we all share. That's the most important. If you'd like a title, it's Pentecost and our family history. Pentecost and our family history. <clears throat> Before we go into the book of Acts, let's turn over to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 15. And we find the command to keep this day. It's, it's connected to the when the sheaf the beginning of the harvest, the first sheaf was taken, was harvested and was waved uh, on the, uh, the, after the Sabbath, after the Passover. We read about that in uh, verses 9 and beyond. And then finally in verse 15 it says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. So there were these two loaves of bread that they would make and they would offer. And we understand, we've been taught that those represent the two congregations. The one is the Old Testament congregation of first fruits and the other is the New Testament congregation. That is what those two loaves represent. The first fruits. Notice in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 22. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 22. It says, and you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So the feast of first fruits is also called the feast of weeks. Why is that? Because we were, they were to count it. They counted seven weeks, seven Sabbaths. And then the day after was then the, the 50th and was the day to observe it, as I think Mr. Nathan has an article in the recent LCN that explains that very well. So let's go to chap Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. We were in there this morning, but we'll just touch on a couple of things. <clears throat> as we look at Pentecost and our family 
history. <laughs> Pentecost and our family history. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, as Mr. Simone read this morning, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. So what does Pentecost mean? Uh, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, under origin and etymology of Pentecost, it comes from a Middle English, it's a Middle English word from an Old English word, Pentecostin, from late Latin, Pentecosta, from the Greek, Pentecoste, Literally 50th day, literally 50th day. So the, it's related to the Feast of Weeks and it's related to the Feast of First Fruits. It's the same, the same day. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, as we heard explained so powerfully this morning. Filled with the Holy Spirit, that promise that had been promised and, and was, was, was poured out in a general way, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what an exciting day that was. The beginning of the New Testament church. Now, understand that our, our family history, when we start talking about the first fruits, we understand our family history goes back before this day, doesn't it? Because we also trace our spiritual lineage back to David and, and Samuel and, and Moses and Abraham, right? And Abel, all the way, all the way back and to, uh, to Adam. But for the sake of discussion, we're just going to limit to our closer relatives today, the last 2,000 years. <laughs> you know, when you look at family albums, sometimes you can't, you can't look at them all at once, right? You've got to take one at a time. So we can't look at... What, you know what? Maybe some of you don't know what a family album is. What if, I'll explain that. A family album is back in ancient times... Like about 10 years ago, they had these books you could get with sticky paper, and then you had to develop pictures, and then you, the pictures would come on special paper, and then you would get the pictures, hold them in your hands, and you put them on the sticky paper, and then you put a film over them, and then there were pages in a photo album, right? Okay, so <clears throat> that's what photo albums were. I know we don't have them anymore, but we're going to look at the New Testament photo album today, the, the story of our family members from the New Testament. We, we read, we heard about this uh, today, this morning again, but let's jump over to uh, verse 40 in Acts chapter 2 with many other words. He, that is Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Tremendous response. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. It was an exciting time. Miracles were being done by, those, by the apostles, and, and people were, were, getting, were being attracted and, and were, were taking notice because of that. You can just imagine the stir that this caused there in Jerusalem. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone who had need. No, this was not a utopian socialistic experiment, you know, a, a, a community like that. It was simply that they were there, as was explained. Uh, they were there. There were people from all over the Roman world at that time. And you can imagine when this was happening... There were a lot of people who wanted to stay a while because this was a big deal, as we heard again this morning. 
And so they needed, they needed sustenance, they needed a place to stay, they needed, uh, they needed food, they needed, as they were setting up this, really this new, this new organization, this new structure, this new entity, which was the New Testament Church of God. So they continued uh, daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So no, it wasn't communism. It was just people of God sharing with one another and those who had need sharing with those who were visiting and, and, and um, I'm sorry, those who had things to, help, to give, sharing with those who had need. And that is our heritage. The, the, these are our relatives. These are our spiritual family members. This is our family history right here. These are our people. Now, why are we even reading this? Because someone wrote it down. Who was that someone? Well, if we go back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, we read a little bit about the introduction to this book of Acts. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So whoever the author was, and we know it, it was Luke, he was writing this to Theophilus. Now, who was Theophilus? All of our spokesman club members know, don't you? It was the thistle sifter, right? We have a tongue twister in spokesman club about Theophilus, the thistle sifter. Sifted a sieve of unsifted thistles. If Theophilus, the thistle sifter, sifted a sieve of unsifted thistles, where is the sieve of sifted, th unsifted sifthles? Theophilus, the thistle sifter, sifted, right? Or something like that. That wasn't this Theophilus, okay? <laughs> Different guy. But there was a member of the church of God. There was a believer whose name was Theophilus, and Luke recorded this for him. Notice, going back to the book of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's go back to... I guess he said the former, um, the former account, what's the former account? Notice in Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, we find what that is. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, Verse 2, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word deliver them to us. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So sometime after all of these events happened, Luke said, there's a need for another account of the Gospels. There apparently were, were already other uh, versions that were being uh, put together, but he knew of certain details and facts, perhaps, that were not in the others, and he said there, there's a need for someone who has some uh, 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 relation to eyewitness accounts and who can... Wit who can uh, interview those who were eyewitnesses. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to share it so that Theophilus, this believer, has evidence of what he's believing. So Luke wrote it down. And he talked to those who were eyewitnesses. 
And he spent the time and the energy and the effort to record what had happened. And brethren, just think about it for a moment. What if Luke had not done that? What will we be missing? Yes, the gospel of Luke, but also the entire book of Acts. How important was it that Luke took an interest in recording for Theophilus? Now, I don't think that Luke had in mind that about almost 2,000 years later, his books would be divided into chapters, divided into verses, would be bound in books, and on this day of Pentecost, there will be a minister preaching from his book, from his letter, from his treatise, and there would be over 200 people sitting in the audience with a copy of his document on their laps. Do you think he had any thought of that? I don't think so. And yet that's exactly the way God has used it. He saw a need. He saw that there was going to be, if someone didn't write things down and he had a particular access to those who were eyewitnesses, we heard about in the special music today about those who were eyewitnesses and he saw the need to make an account before those people died. And how thankful we are today that we have a record of it. And it was not lost. Our family history. And we can look at it today. What's the point? Well, we are a part of the church that began on this day of Pentecost. And we trace our roots to these events that we're reading about in the book of Acts, to our spiritual roots. And again, just as a family will have cherished photo albums and cherished books about family history or, or letters, this is our family history. My mother has been... I, <clears throat> mother, I, I'm not going to try to embarrass you intentionally, but my mother has been uh, typing up letters from uh, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s that she wrote to her mother uh, as she was going through stages in her life, and her mother, my grandmother, saved every one of them. Amazing. She saved, she saved all kinds of interesting things, and she saved all of these letters, and my mother's been typing them up. And it's really been fun to go through them and to hear them and to recount them and to, to look at some of the things that have happened and, and they're very, very special. It reminds me also when my brothers and I were small, we wrote up a document. Uh, it was in multicolored ink. <clears throat> it said, Dear Mother and Dad, when you are old, we will take care of you. <laughs> Signed, Jonathan McNair. Peter McNair, Rod McNair. You know she has that document in the safe? <laughs> I've tried to get my hands on it, but all I can get is a copy of it. I've not seen the original. It, it's, uh, it is in a safe place. Some of the things uh, back when our children were, were very small, uh, you know how children say the most amazing things and you think, I'll never forget what, that, what they just said. And you do. So, so we started writing them down. And so from, a little, from, from little children, we started, I would write them down. I'd pull out my notebook and I'd write down the quotes of what one of them would say and who said it and their age and the date and the con a little bit of context why they said it. And some of the, the best times today are sitting around and just pulling out those books and reading them. And we laugh so hard because of those memories and the silly things that, that they said. You know, records and, and, and letters and photographs, anything that is tangible is so special and so valuable to a family. Well, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, 
is special and precious and valuable because it's our family. Not just memories, not just goofy things that were said, but it's truth. It's our family heritage, isn't it? How thankful we are to this man, Luke, who we've never met, who didn't know us, who knew nothing about how we were going to be using this book today, but had the foresight to write it down for Theophilus the Thistle Sifter. We are a part of the church that began in 31 AD. Do we really feel connected to them? Do we identify to them as our family? <clears throat> you know, one of the things that Luke recorded that Peter said to the crowd that was gathered on that day, said, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as our Lord will call. You know, Peter had a sense, and he, he was perhaps inspired to say, had a sense that there was something that was going to be happening way beyond just the here and now. Let's turn over to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. In 2 Peter, we read a little bit about some of the things that Peter said toward the end of his life and did. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Again, as we heard this morning, that by which we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that we could even be partakers of the divine nature, that we can even begin to think like God and take, take on his spirit and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. He talks about how we're going to have to fight for it, how we're going to have to put effort into it, adding faith and virtue and, and knowledge and self-control and brotherly kindness and perseverance. And he says, if these things are in you and they abound, you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. He said, don't be short-sighted. Don't forget the past, what Christ has done for you in forgiving you, in bringing you out of whatever your background was. Don't be short-sighted. And also, don't forget what you've become a part of, that you're a part of the living church of the great God, the family of God, the family that is in in begotten now and going to be born into his very kingdom, in e into eternity. Don't get short-sighted. And isn't that a warning for us today? You know, there are so many ways we can get our focus on the here and now, on paying the bills, on taking out the garbage, on dealing with our health issues, dealing with the job issues, the dog dies, you know, the cat gets sick, whatever. That's why the weekly Sabbath comes. That's why the annual Sabbaths come. That's why we're keeping Pentecost right now, to get our eyes off of our problems and onto the big picture. Whether you are a father or a mother or a college student or a middle school student or a senior or a youngster, we all have our challenges, don't we? We all have something that we're dealing with. 
And yet God is telling us and, and, and calling us and bringing us into his presence to help us for a little while to say, look at the big picture. Look at where you came from, where you're connected to in the past. And look at where you're going. Look at where I'm taking you. You know, we can't forget our children wrestle with challenges. I remember lying awake at night, terrified of giving a report in fifth grade the next day. I can see, I can still, the, the moon was shining. It was a full moon that night. My brothers were asleep. And it was middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. I was terrified. I was so worried, sick, because I had to give a book report the next day in fifth grade. I was so nervous. You know, it was a major stress on me. Young people, I survived. <laughs> and guess what? I'm giving another book report today <laughs> in front of about 240 people. Big people, adults. Our children face daunting challenges, and you know, we need to be patient with them and not just brush it off. We need to talk with them, we need to listen to them, and not think, oh, that's silly, you shouldn't worry about that, because to them it's a big deal. The point is that we're all facing challenges, aren't we? We're all facing challenges, big and small, and we need the big picture. We need what this day gives us what God's plan gives us. We need to feel connected down deep to those people who lived 2,000 years ago when this church began, when God's church was founded on the day of Pentecost. He says, Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. If you do these things, you'll never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. He, he knew he was going to die soon. He knew he was not going to live very much longer. And what happens when you start to reach that point? You start to think, how am I going to make sure that what God has shown me is going to be passed on? How am I going to make sure when I was an eyewitness of these things, how am I going to make sure when I'm not around that what God has done will not be lost? Verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always, always have a reminder of these things after my decease. What are we talking about? Mr. O'Gwen, Mr. John O'Gwen explained this back in 2002 in an article entitled, How Did We Get the Bible? Tomorrow's World. He said, while the Hebrew scriptures were complete from the days of Ezra, God's revelation to mankind was not finished. In the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, accounts of his life and ministry were written. Letters to fledgling congregations were written. As the decades passed, those who were first-hand witnesses of what Jesus Christ said and did began to pass from the scene. False teachers arose who were teaching, quote, a different gospel, end quote. They also wrote letters, often signing the name of the one of the apostles, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. In such confusion, how was an accurate account of Christ's teachings and the teachings of his apostles to be preserved for future generations of disciples? Good question. What would happen after their death when they all died out? Would this just be lost forever? Would there never be any family records of this family, this church family? Peter addresses the issue in 2 Peter, the last letter he wrote, written shortly before his execution, not long after Paul's death. Peter puts things into perspective. 
Referring to his soon approaching death in verse 14, Peter states, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. The only way that he could ensure a permanent record of what he had taught was to leave behind writings, officially designated as Holy Scripture. You know, a lot of people debate about how the, the New Testament canon was made. Well, it seems pretty obvious that God used the original apostles, the original eyewitnesses, to write down what they saw. You know, in a legal document, in, in, a, in the legal system, in a trial, hearsay doesn't account too much. But first-hand evidence, first-hand accounts, eyewitness accounts carry weight. And it also makes sense that they would, as time go, goes by, they would be responsible for collecting those documents and making sure that they were accurate. And the ones preserved and passed on were the, were the true, and accurate, um, true and accurate ones. So going on in 2 Peter in verse uh, 1 and verse 16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Mr. O'Gwen writes, beginning in verse 16, Peter abruptly switched from using the first person singular to using we, the first person plural. Who was the we to whom Peter referred in verses 16 through 19. He defined the we in verse 18 when he referred to them having witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus on the mount. This event is in Matthew 17, 1, where we learn that only Peter, James, and John accompanied Jesus and were first-hand witnesses of the event. James, the brother of John, was the first to be martyred, had been dead for decades. Therefore, the we is Peter and John the last remaining ones who had been on the mount to see that vision. He goes on to say in 2 Peter 1, 19, that we, he and John, were the only ones remaining who possessed the sure word of prophecy. In other words, Peter was pointing out to his readers that he and John were the ones designated by Christ to leave behind an authoritative record that would guide the Christian community in generations to come long after the death of the original apostles and disciples. So what do we see? Peter was concerned about the future. Peter was about to be executed. Peter was about to, end his, to, to have his life ended. And yet, his world didn't get small. It got big. He saw the big picture. He saw the need to make sure before his decease that these things were written and recorded and gathered and were accurate so that those who would come later would have the truth. He also talked about Paul in this chapter, or rather in chapter 3. Mr. O'Gwen refers to it in chapter 3, verse 15. He referred to Paul's writings in a way that indicated that they were complete. Mentioning all of his letters, he also referred to people distorting them as they did, quote, the rest of the scriptures. Peter defined Paul's letters as scripture on par with the Old Testament and intimated that Paul was no longer alive to respond to those who sought to twist his meaning. And we can read it in chapter 3, verse 14. Here is in 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And considering that the, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. People were already twisting Paul's writings back then, and they still do to this day, don't they? 
as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Scholars try, some scholars try to make it out like there was a division in the early church between, you know, Peter and those who were more of a, a Jewish leaning and, though, and Paul who taught Pauline theology, who, who took it in a totally different direction. There was no schism between the two. Sure, there were discussions, there were times when there were disagreements, but they came to a unified, complete conclusion. And Peter shows that right here. Before his death, Peter validated and put his stamp of approval on Paul's writings. What a precious, precious letter this is for us. Family document right here so that we can know our family history. And we can know what Peter thought about Paul's writings. And we can know, understand that they were unified. There was no division amongst them. The point is, again, Peter had the big picture. Do we? Do we? This is our family History and understanding our family history helps to put our own lives in context and helps us even to endure the trials that we face. To know there's a reason, there's a point to it. We're not alone. Our forebears have gone through things and we can face challenges too. John chapter, uh, thir let's go to 3 John chapter 1 and verse 1. Toward the end of the first century, John, the Apostle John, was now the last living eyewitness of Jesus Christ. You think about that for a moment. All of his colleagues, all of his compatriots, all of his contemporaries were gone. And John was still alive. And one of the things that he focused on was that Jesus Christ was real because there was a crazy heresy going around at that time that he had not been really in the flesh. He was a sort of a phantom. And this could have been a very discouraging time for John, the Apostle John. You think about it, living, outliving all of his contemporaries. And yet he wasn't self-absorbed. He wasn't just thinking about himself. He saw himself as a sort of a grandfather figure passing on truth to the next generation. 3 John chapter 1 and verse 1. Notice the elder, he saw himself as the elder, he was the elder, to the beloved Gaius whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth and I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth doesn't it sort of sound like a grandfather talking to his grandchildren an elder gathering around the younger generation in the household there's a special connection. Do you remember hearing your grandfather tell stories about the family? Do you ever get sick of them? You know, I remember as young people, my, my grandfather on my mother's side, my mother's father, was a, a music man, her, her father, Peter Oakes. He had bands, he organized choirs, uh, in the community as well as in the church and orchestras. And I remember as a youngster, it seemed like half of the rehearsal was him just talking. And I have to admit that sometimes we yawned a bit. Like, there he goes again. I've heard that story before. How I would love to hear him now. How I would love to talk to him now. You know, it wasn't just about music. That's not why he labored in the field, though he loved music. But he loved working with people. He loved working with young people. He loved teaching them about life. He loved passing on to them things he had learned about life. 
And I'd like to challenge our young people, if you still have your grandfather or grandmother around, or if you don't, spiritual grandparents. You know, the church, the seniors in the church can act as our spiritual grandparents. Take the time, young people, to stop and listen to them and get to know them and see what they have to say about their life and advice and wisdom. Cherish the time that they take to pass on experience and wisdom and family history with you. There will come a time when they're gone. When they're gone. I think this is the feeling that John surely must have had as he was the last man standing from that generation. So what did he write about? 1 John 1 and verse 1. Notice 1 John 1 and verse 1. That which we was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. He said, in the middle of all this nonsense, now, toward the end of the first century, I can tell you that Christ really was here. We heard him, I heard him, I saw him, I touched him. I was there. And he says, I'm passing this on to you. Now he's writing to the brethren. He's not just keeping it to himself. He's wanting to pass this on. And he's saying, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're not just a social club. The connection is that we have God living in us, that we are fellowshipping with Jesus Christ and the Father through the Holy Spirit. And that's how we're connected to our spiritual family back then. We are a family. We need to be connected as a family. <clears throat> Again, where would we be if the book of Acts wasn't here, if the book of Luke wasn't here, if the epistles of Peter weren't here, if the writings of the apostle John weren't here, they all were looking forward beyond themselves. They had the big picture that this needed to be preserved. Even after the apostle John, we have history recording John's disciples, one of them Polycarp, and then later Polycrates, continuing in his teachings. And just as important, recognizing the authenticity, authenticity sorry, of the New Testament Scripture. And let me read a little bit from a book entitled The Apostasy of the Lost Century, page 92, from S. Gustin Olson, written in 1986. It says this, In an era when heresies were widespread, it was imperative that the norms and doctrines of Christianity be established by the writings of the apostles. The definition of Christianity would otherwise become lost. The bishops who submitted to the criterion of the apostolic writings were able to discern the deviations from the original faith. Hence, Polycarp, who seems to live and have his being in the word of God, noticed the error which led to the quarto decimate controversy. What he's saying is after the death of John, that became an absolute big deal. What were the authentic writings of the apostles? Why was it so important that Luke recorded, that Peter recorded, that John recorded? Because after they were dead, there was all kinds of controversy. And it wasn't that long before those in Rome were not keeping Passover. And suddenly you had the quarto decimal controversy. Why? Quarto decimal means the 14th. Why? Because some were still keeping the 14th and others were not 
Polycarp, as he was familiar with John's first epistle, he realized that dissenters and antinomians, those who are against law, that's just what that word means, dissenters and antinomians had once been mistaken for converted members of the church, 1 John 2.19. Ever since the first century, false teachers simply rejected parts or the entirety of writings which the church had already considered scripture. Others were perverting the meaning of them, 2 Peter 3.17. Polycarp and the Asian Christians' staunch refusal to compromise with their Christian principles was based on their belief that scripture was inspired by God and provided an authentic and trustworthy means by which Christ was speaking. In other words, after the apostles were gone, there became two different schools of thought. One was among the faithful, small, persecuted group of God's people was that we're going with what the apostles said and did and wrote and preserved. The others said, well, there were oral traditions that were secretly passed on. And not everybody knows them, but we know them. And we'll teach them, and you'll have to rely on our authority. Does that ring any bells? Is that not what modern Christianity has been based on? And does that not remind us why it's so important that we know and recognize our family history. Accurate, truthful family history. Right here. What does this have to do with us? And what does it have to do with Pentecost? We find ourselves in the last generations or generation before Christ's return. In a time when the trend is toward being inward, retreating to the self, getting small-minded, and it's not hard to find examples, just look at abortion. You think about it. 60 million people, 60 million babies have been killed. How can you find a better example of a society that is thinking small and not thinking about the future and not thinking about how What's going to happen to the next generation? How can you find a better example of cutting off that generation, of thinking only about the self? And what we find is some of the Western societies, now countries, are in danger of slipping backwards in population. Why? Because they kill their children. How short-sighted can you get? They're a nuisance. You know, it used to be that children we're the future. You have children to carry on the family line. You have children to take care of you when you get old. But now they're a nuisance. They're in the way. What about our national debt? You know, again, what is it, $21 trillion? That's what it was this morning. It goes so fast, it's probably something else now. Any sane leader in this country knows that our future is being wasted away. And we might already be past the point of no return. If not, we're getting close where it is simply practically, theoretically, hypothetically impossible to ever pay it off. How is that thinking about the future? And how is that thinking big-minded? You know, that should be a national emergency today. Every leader in our country should be banding together to preserve any sort of future for the next generation. But no, it's short-term thinking. Take care of myself. I know it's going to collapse, but I'm not going to worry about it because I'm not going to be there. You know, brethren, these, these are the big problems, but we can fall into short-term thinking too because we get overwhelmed. We have debts. We have bills. We have health issues. We have problems working together sometime. 
relationship issues, dealing with a difficult boss, we must not let those things swallow us up. We must keep the big picture. Now is not the time to think small. Now is the time to think big. Now is not the time to retreat and retract. Now is the time to think about our heritage from the past and our legacy into the future of what God is doing in this church family that he built and is building. In the remaining time, let's focus on several specific points, takeaways, as we observe this day, this Pentecost. Number one, th things that we can do and must do as we face an uncertain time, as we face really are on the cusp of the collapse of this society. We must embrace our first fruits identity. We must embrace our first fruits identity. Mr. Ames spoke about that last week. You know, we can have an identity of a lot of things. Our hobbies, our work, our money, our status, our lack of money, you know, that can be our identity. Um, our title, our position. What's your identity? Is our identity being a part of this family and being a part of what God is doing? Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. We are called to be first fruits. And he describes here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Now Christ is risen from the dead, has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. This profound, incredible truth that God is not yet calling the whole world, but he's only calling a few, and those are the first fruits, and those are us. Is that our identity? Or do we get confused and distracted by all of the thousands of other things that can become our primary identity? Are we allowing God to crush anything else that stands in the way of really identifying with what he's doing in our life. Being a first fruit. That's what we're here for. Matthew chapter 18, Christ said he would build his church and the gates of the grave would not prevail against it. There would always be someone in every generation who was a part of the family. Christ promised it. There will always be someone on earth who was carrying on the legacy and carrying the torch. We just have to decide whether we're going to be a part of that. If we don't do it, someone else will. Number two. Number two. We must immerse ourselves in the work of God. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. What were some of the final instructions here that Christ gave to his disciples, as we think about what are we to do in this end time, you know, do we, can we get discouraged? Do we get distracted? Do we get confused? Well, notice what he told them, Mark, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came, spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Do you think he's going to accomplish his work? Is there any limit to his power to do his work, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. As we heard yesterday, he'll never leave us. He'll never leave us. We've got to immerse ourselves in the work of God. One big antidote for small thinking is getting involved in the work, having our hearts in the work, praying for the work, contributing for in the work, having our hearts in it, 
letting our treasure be in the work. To care about this world. And you know what? If no one else responds from this time forward, at least we're throwing the lifeline out there. At least we're throwing the lifeline out there. And that's our job. That's why first fruits are called. Immerse ourselves in the work of God, not get small. Number three, we've got to establish family testimonies. We've got to establish family testimonies. I don't have time to read it, but please read Dr. Fall's booklet about successful parenting God's way. There's a section on family testimonies where he talks about how in their family, as their children would grow up, they would talk about how God had delivered them time and time again. He gives the example of how they were on an icy road in Arkansas and black ice and, and it started and the, 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 it began to rain, uh, freezing rain, couldn't see. They quickly prayed and within just a few minutes they lost control and an oncoming car, there was no way to avoid it. And somehow they felt a power or a pressure move the car and there they were on the other side and the, the, the oncoming car was passed. There was no earthly way to accomplish what happened. And those kind of things need to be rehearsed. What about in your family? What about with our children? We need to talk about what God is doing in our lives. We need to share those stories. Let them be family testimonies. Let them be part of the family history in our personal families. It's important. One of the things I appreciate about my, my wife's father and mother is that they really did this. He didn't just write it in the book. And to this day when the siblings get together, some of those same things come up about how God took care of them and helped them in, in, in some pretty horrible health issues and situations. We need to do that in our, in our families. What if you have no children? That's okay. You will in the future. You'll have lots of them. You'll have lots of spiritual children. And you know what? They're even more closely related to you than physical, if you think about it. Because our spiritual DNA is more real even than our physical DNA. So number four, prepare to teach your spiritual children. Why are we here? Are we here just to sort of absorb the truth and help it make our lives better? Or are we going to be ruling in God's family and have sons and daughters spiritually who will look to us as father figures and mother figures as family and we'll look to them as our real children. Real, when I say real, I mean we've got the same spiritual DNA. And someday, 100 or 200 years from now, there will be children who will grow and they'll want to know about the past. And if you're ruling over a city, they'll ask you, they'll look at you like their grandfather or like their grandmother. And they'll say, tell me what it was like back before the tribulation. I want to hear the family history again. What was it like living back in Satan's world? How did you do it? It sounds horrible. How did you make it? What did God do in your life? How did he help you? What were you thinking? And what enabled you to persevere? How did you remain faithful in such an evil world? You know, just how we want to talk to Joseph and Samuel and Moses and David and get to know them, those people are going to want to talk to you. What was it like living in this era? And we'll relate the testimonies of how great God was to us 
How merciful, how kind, how patient, how faithful, how powerful. And you know, many of those testimonies are yet unwritten, are yet unlived. Many of those great things that God is going to do have not yet happened yet. Still to come, still ahead. We can't shrink back. There's still work to do. and We've got to make it so we can be there to tell them those stories. We can be a part of a long line of faithful people in their past. We can be one link, one faithful link in a long chain of God's people who've lived and died faithfully to the end in service to them. And this day of Pentecost teaches us that. Revelation 2.26 says, He who overcomes, I will give power over the nations. And Micah 4 talks about there's going to become a time when peace will come and the saints will rule and no one shall make the inhabitants of the earth afraid anymore. That's you and that's me that's going to make that happen. No one shall make them afraid. This world needs someone who will help them to no longer be afraid. And we're preparing to teach them, teach our spiritual children. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Now we're in the moment. We're in this moment of time. Sometimes we're grieved by pressures and burdens and trials and problems, but we're not alone. We have a long line of people behind us who've walked this path. And we have many coming ahead who are going to learn this path. And we can be there if we have the patience and vision to see. When we started out, we said we just talked about the New Testament saints, but actually the family goes back much further, doesn't it? This chapter relates the Old Testament saints. And it talks about how, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They had vision. They thought big, no matter what trials they were going through in this whole chapter, outlines many of the trials they went through. But they kept the big picture. For those who say such things declare plainly they seek a homeland and truly if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared a city for them. We have ancestors that go way back in every age and they continued the heritage. They took what heritage they were given and they created their own legacy for the future. They had vision. And they prepared those who came after. Hebrews 11 and verse 39. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not yet receive the promise. Verse 40. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So therefore, chapter 12, verse 1. What's the conclusion? What do we do? How do we go forward with courage and faith? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with patience, with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Brethren, we have a great heritage. We're a part of a great family. A great family. And we have records of that family. We have a book of our family history. 
And it's reliable. It's not myths and legends. It's truth because they were eyewitnesses and they wrote it down. And they lived it. And they died for it. And this book has been passed on to us as our heritage, as our family history, not just to be put on the shelf, but to be lived and to be passed on as well. The day of Pentecost teaches us this, that we have a priceless heritage, being a part of the family that's going to be born into literal, eternal life. It also teaches us we've got a job to do, to grab onto this truth and take it forward, to stand up, to do our job, be strong, be faithful, don't shrink back, be bold. Don't think small, but think big. So that we can be there for the next generation. Our family history is being written right now. Let's keep that big picture. Let's be focused, let's be zeroed in on seeking God with all of our hearts. He's building a family. What a great family it is that we are a part of. And it's going to last forever.